Today, this morning, we're going to start off with Cheryl Smith Rogers as our speaker. Cheryl lives in Blanco. She's a longtime journalist and photographer. She holds a journalism degree from Trinity University and worked for many years as a newspaper reporter and editor. She's been published in a number of magazines, Better Homes and Gardens, Guidepost, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Highways. Uh, recently, she was published in our local, and I think also the Blanco local, um, Co-op Power with a couple of different articles. In the beginning, Cheryl and her husband bought ornaments for their yard, but not for long. Soon they turned their focus to Texas plants. Today, their diversified native habitat attracts scores of wildlife and also gardening groups. Along the way, she had many adventures and a lot of aha moments. Uh, she's seen things like a beetle taking a shower, bees sleeping upside down, an ant that's really a spider, a wasp that's really a moth. She, today she'll share snippets of the different things that she's seen and learned just in her native neighborhood. Uh, Cheryl has a blog called uh, Window on Texas Wildscape, and that's how I first met her, following her blog. And she has a wonderful combination of a child's curiosity and a librarian's research ability. So she always comes up with really interesting things, and I think you'll enjoy her talk. Okay, Cheryl, are you ready? Yes, I sure am. Let's share the screen. Okay, I'm gonna get that out of the way. I'm gonna hit play. Um, okay, so can y'all see me or do you need to see me? Am I there? Okay. You're doing just fine. Hi. Okay, well, good morning and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a brand new program. I'm very honored to be asked to speak at your fall symposium. And when Paula asked me, I thought, well, okay, maybe I could put something together about, uh, like she said, the things that I've seen and learned and, and observed. Just a little backstory on me. I grew up in Corpus Christi. I've been a nature nerd since the 60s and the 70s. Here I am going to day camp among the mesquites. Uh, my brother and I um, in Wimberley, my grandfather Smith had a, a home uh, above the Blanco River, so came full circle when I moved to Blanco in 1989. Um, so anyway, yes, I've, I've played with um, horn toads in my neighborhood in Corpus Christi and in the red harvester ant beds. I cried a few times. I got stung, but I kept doing it. And I still am a nature nerd. Um, I'm game to hold anything. Here's uh, me at my master naturalist training. I've been mm -hmm. a Texas master naturalist since 2012. Um, and I love spiders. If you know anything about me, then uh, I, I give spider programs as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Started teaching myself about them in the 90s. And here's me at the Wildflower Center. So in 2005, at the end of it, I, I met this guy. It turns out we went to high school together in Corpus Christi at Cal Allen High School. And we got married five months later, James Hearn. And he's my partner in crime here in Blanco. And I couldn't have done any of this without him. He moved rocks around and mulch. And um, we've worked real hard to uh, put in these gardens at our home here. So the house is on Ninth Street. Um, it's a 1956 vintage, if you read my article in the Texas Co-op Power magazine. Um, but the yard kind of looked like this. I put these rocks in. I was so proud. This is a crepe myrtle that was already here. And this bed up front was filled with Japanese honeysuckle and, and greenbrier. And I spent an, you know, an afternoon pulling all that out. I was so proud of myself when I planted uh, the zinnias. Well, now this will kind of give you an idea of what it looks like in, the, in our front yard. This is an older photograph. We have a, a pretty large wafer ash now behind our sign. We are a demonstration site for Texas Wildscapes program. And that's where I got the name of my blog. Um, the program's on hi hiatus right now. Um, they don't have enough staff, but the um, principals uh, behind the program, uh, we really try to adhere to, to provide a habitat and food and water for wildlife. So this is our front yard. The backyard, when I first moved in, I had one bird bath, one uh, bird feeder. Here's the washing machine hose snaking out into the backyard. Uh, a sea of St. Augustine grass. I was told it was uh, uh, Floritam and uh, it crept over from uh, the neighbor's yard, but nothing much going on. 
now this is what it looks like. We're just starting our fall season of, of blooming plants, the plateau golden eye and fall aster starting to bloom. And then the mist flowers um, will be the last one. So put in, a, extended our patio and put in another little stone patio and a water feature. Looking off towards the other direction, this is what it looked like. Um, the original picnic table that Mr. Bendeley built probably in his ag class at the high school back in the day. Um, so now I took a more recent picture. It's not a real good one, but it kind of shows you um, what's been done to our backyard now. Um, we were also able, James and I, to purchase the adjoining vacant lot. Uh, and that was in 2008. And um, I told James, I said, how about we put up a sign, like a state park sign that says the meadow. And that way people will know in the neighborhood and driving by that this isn't just a vacant lot that it's being cared for. And it does get mowed occasionally. I get questions about that, but we have blue bonnets and, and there you can see uh, the Indian blankets. One year it was covered up in prairie verbena. Another year it was just covered up with stiff green thread. So it's always different every year. Oh, and just as an aside, we have been featured on uh, Central Texas Gardener, it aired in 2016. You can do a um, search and find it. It was, uh, they came out, Linda and her, her team came out to film this and it was, oh, during the time of those horrific floods and we were actually under a tornado warning that day and we had to do our interview inside our house <laughs> and hurry up and do it. So that was kind of some backstory. Um, in the beginning, um, like Paula said, we, mm. we just kind of went to the um, nurseries and whatever and picked out some plants, you know, and put them in the ground. We didn't know, know what we wanted to do. And we, we hit it right on a few of them. We did plant some natives. We real, like I said, we didn't really know what we were doing. We still have leadwort, plumbago. That's mm -hmm. not a native, but it's a nice ground cover. We have red column by now, the yellow dyed. Um, so then we started branching out as the years went by. We went to plant sales uh, like Cibolo Nature Center and, and Bernie has a wonderful plant sale every year. The Wildflower Center in Austin is wonderful too. Um, we also went to some native nurseries like in Medina. I have to look at my notes. The Natives of Texas, that's David Winningham. Uh, we got a Blanco crab apple tree there in a Medina, the Medina Garden Nursery and that's Ernesto Carino and Ishmael Espinosa. Got some wonderful natives there. And friends along the way have given us uh, Texas natives like Linda and Ron Chang. I got to mention them in Spring Branch. Um, so we have probably planted I, more than 200, I'm sure, native species in our yard. Um, like Paul mentioned, I started this blog in 08. I was trying to keep notes in a spiral notebook. Um, like what, what we planted and, and when and where and all that. And it just, it wasn't working. So then blogs were getting started and uh, I thought, hey, I'm gonna get a, give it a shot. I didn't know what I was doing. And um, it worked out really well because it's, um, when we plant something, I, I noted on the blog and, and um, insects, birds, adventures. And it's a great way to just keep track of things. And then I can search it too. Somebody will ask me a question. So, well, let me go to my blog. Um, and, and find out, or somebody might ask, where do you get the labels for when you um, put, I have labels on the plants in our yard. Well, it's on my blog, Paw Paw Metal, I think is the name of the company. Um, so, you know, being a reporter, I'm naturally curious. I would see insects and, and different kinds of spiders and whatnot. It's like, what is that? What is that? And so I would go to bugguide.net. And I also started using the uh, scientific names in the very beginning of my blog. So if I put a plant up, I usually try to put the botanical name. If it's an insect, then the scientific name. And that way, if somebody is searching for spe something specific, it's going to come up on my blog. But I use, I still use Bug Guide. It's a wonderful resource. And also for plants, um, for native plants, the uh, Wildflower Center, um, wildflower.org. Y'all know about this. I don't need to tell you. This is the Native Plant Society. Um, in 20, 15, I started trying to use iNaturalist. I just couldn't get the hang of it. And then in 2016, there was a bio blitz and I got involved with that. And then I met, I went to the uh, Texas Master Naturalist Conference that year and met up with Sam Kishnick. Uh, he's Sam Biology on iNaturalist. And I believe he's speaking tomorrow. 
and uh, give him a good plug. He lives in Breeze. I'm sorry, Sam, but you do. I naturalist. He loves I naturalist. And so he was a great inspiration to me. And I hit 1,000 species last December. That was my goal here in our yard. And so I only take I naturalist observations within our yard, which is about an acre here in Blanco. And uh, there's a few exceptions that I've taken outside our yard. But so yesterday or today, this morning, I updated this. So I've hit 1,105 species in our yard. So I'm, um, it's just a lot of fun for me. And iNaturalist is just a very powerful tool. You can run searches like, you know, here in our yard, I have documented 83 so far uh, species of spiders and other arachnids. So the vascular plants here, um, when you break that down, 187, those are only going to be the plants that I have found here. In other words, I don't take observations. This does not include the, the plants that we have planted, only the plants that grow here, either they're, in, you know, they might be introduced, they might be invasive. Um, on that note, I did take some screenshots of some of the natives or the plants that that are here and like I said oh, oh there's Maltasar thistle and yeah one year um, discovered that we had that growing along the easement of our meadow and so we eradicated that oh and this Cretan wood that's also introduced that's not a native so all that to say that here's a nice quote from the National Wildlife Federation about how native plants um, you know they form these symbiotic relationships with the native wildlife and that's you know really the most suitable habitat. And I love your slogan, um, your motto, native plants equals healthy habitats. And that is just so, so true. And so I had to throw in a quote for me because for me, when I go out every day and walk along the, um, the paths, it's a treasure hunt. It really is. I just, I never know what I'm going to see, what I'm going to learn, what I'm going to find. And I take my phone, I've got a little pouch here. Uh, it's kind of like an, uh, a holster. Put my, my, I, if I go outside without my phone, I always wish that I had taken it and had to run back in the house and go get it. So anyway, that's what I want to do with this program is just share a little bit because I could keep you here all day and I won't do that, I promise. But what I've seen and learned, so. So she mentioned the bees. Yes, one, one evening, 2014, I came upon these bees that were sleeping upside down on dead salvia. And so I took some pictures and I think I, um, I, I rousted one awake and he flew off and went off and slept by himself. And then he came back and got everybody, here he comes back. And he kind of upset everybody. And I think everybody finally went back to sleep, but these are all males. And I think they're young males. And so they sleep um, upside down um, in vegetation, wherever they can find. Um, this is the only time I haven't seen this since. That's the thing too, is that it's kind of a, a right time, right place. And I happened to see these guys and got some images. It's so interesting to me. That's, it just it fascinates me. Um, <clears throat> when I was putting this program together, I realized that I had two different species. I, I guess I was thinking they were both mesquite boars. But then come to, when I looked closer, I realized I had two different species. They look very much alike. Um, and this one was on the, the white mist flower. My daughter took this picture back in 08. So I got a new species for iNaturalist um, several summers ago. Saw these purple caterpillars, worms, grubs. I just was like, whoa, I'd never seen anything so purple. Come to find out they're mall mallow sawflies. They were eating up our velvet leaf mallow. And so I had a friend across Blanco that I guess she texted me and she sent me a picture of these purple things on her, I don't know if it was Turk's cap. I said, oh yeah, those are mallow sawflies. Um, they're fine. And here's a, an adult. I had to borrow a picture. Anytime I do that, I always credit the um, photographer, but this is what the adult looks like. <clears throat> and they must, they're, they're, they're very convivial. They always eat together and they hang out together. <clears throat> I'm sure they must drop down into the soil after they get to a certain age. But I let them be, they don't eat it all up. And that's what we want is we want these um, insects and other kinds of wildlife to come into our yard and, and eat. Now they're, 
the Genesta broom moths in the past, they have really eaten up my wild green indigo and I've had to squash a few of them. But this year the indigo really grew strong and by the time the caterpillar showed up, it, it, was, it was fine. They, they didn't really cause any damage, so I let them be. So another time I saw this caterpillar or actually several of them. And this was in our pearl milkweed vine, which grows in our neighborhood. It was growing on the other side of the fence. And I asked our neighbor, who's now, she's in heaven now, but I asked for her permission. I could dig some up and bring them to our side of the, yard, the fence. And that's one thing I'm trying to do here in our neighborhood, because we still have some areas that are not developed to bring in the species that are there, you know, into our yard and, and to try and preserve them. So anyway, this caterpillar, though, I learned was a late Lassix, Lassix sphinx moth. Very, very interesting caterpillar. I mean, look at the head there, the little knobs, but it's a very drab sphinx moth, not very exciting. But I, I thought they were pretty cool caterpillars and they haven't come back. That's the only time so far. We have a narrowly four o'clock species in our neighborhood and I saw it several years ago growing on the other side of the fence on um, like street easement. I thought well that's an interesting you know plant and lo and behold it shows up. I'm pointing out the window here. There's a bed that James planted with salvias several years ago and it showed up there. I was like okay that's fine you can stay there that's pretty cool. Well, then it jumped the path. It's kind of a highway there, and it's re, it's a turned out to be a prolific reseeder. And I've got to do a better job of reining it in. It's hard for me because anytime you know something germinates, I don't want to kill it. It's kind of like insects. I do the same thing. Anyway, so I happened to see this little tiny, tiny bug. This is the flower. Here's a close up. So this is a leaf footed bug, and here's probably the teenager, and then the adult. I think I have the species correct, but I know I had the genus right. So I was thinking maybe they just host on these four clocks, but I think they feed on other kinds of plants as well. But I just thought that that was interesting. So I bet y'all have seen these caterpillars. I think last year we had an abundance of them in our yard. They're kind of scary, fierce looking. I think they're interesting. I think they're kind of pretty, beautiful. Um, and yes, if you rub against them, as I did find out firsthand, that they will sting, kind of like stinging nettle. It goes away, it's not you know, harmful. <clears throat> but that's why they look so spiny. They're telling you to stay away. Grody's buck moth. But then they turn into these beautiful um, moths. And I was out walking around like I do with my phone and saw this couple honeymooning. And I'm assuming they were busy making more caterpillars for the next season. And they host, I went and checked on oaks. And so there's live oaks right above um, this bed with the live limestone rocks, but just a beautiful moth. There's a lot of caterpillars that turn into beautiful, you know, kind of ugly, and they turn into beautiful butterflies and moths. I put a few slides together, because like I said, I could keep you here all day, but I won't, of things that I've found. And I don't know if you've ever seen a jagged ambush bug, and this was on our Texas kidney wood. That's a great pollinator attractor. Um, he looks like a little dinosaur to me. He's about, I don't know, less than a half an inch, pretty tiny. And um, all, so all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. And true bugs, like the jagged ambush bug, has a pro, I have to look it up, proboscis. That's a hard one, proboscis. That's a sucking mouth part, and that's, insects don't have that. So um, anyway, I just love the little ambush bugs. And the a cardinal jumping spider, I was real excited when I found this one a few years ago. And then in the last week or two, I found two. One was in our mailbox. And so I carried her out to our barberry in the backyard, put her there. I was walking by and looked down and thought, saw what I thought to be was a ladybug on uh, the Zizotes milkweed. But then I looked closer and it was, turned out to be a swamp milkweed leaf beetle. It was just beautiful. I'd, I'd never seen one before. Um, it showed up and it's gone. And so maybe I'll see it again someday. The cactus fly, I love cactus flies. They're very friendly. I like to think they're, they're kissing me, but I think they're more like maybe looking for minerals or salt on my skin, but they're just a cool fly. Don't e they don't even look like a fly, do they? And then the mottled tortoise beetle, hosts on our tie vine 
for the purple bindweed, which some people think is kind of weedy and it does kind of be, it's a morning glory and it can be a little aggressive. Um, I've also found a golden tortoise beetle on the vine, uh, on the tie vine as well. I love tortoise beetles, they're beautiful. So owl flies, um, those are the ant lines that you see right now. We've got like an ant line town, the upside down funnels in the ground and they're, you know, the larvae are waiting for an ant to fall. And this is what they turn into, some of them, the owl flies. Um, saw my first tailed orange this summer. Uh, we do have snakes, love snakes. Here's a red striped ribbon uh, that was in the backyard. Hadn't seen it since, but um, love our snakes. And I love this wasp with the big eyes. And I don't know if you've been able to see a fiery searcher beetle. They're beautiful. They're larger, about mm, maybe an inch. Flea beetles, yes, they jump. They do jump. Like that's why they how they get their common name. We have six or six or eight species that I've documented in our yard. They're all beautiful. And this one was on snapdragon vine, which is a Blanco County native and another aggressive one. It reseeds and spreads, and I've done a bad job of not keeping that under control. Um, the Sonoran bumblebee, I was out in the front yard and saw this bumblebee and I thought that's not an American bumblebee because the color was a little different. It just was a richer uh, yellow. So anyway, found out it's a Sonoran bumblebee. Beautiful. And this was my first goat weed leaf wing and she was feeding on the uh, Texas lantana berries, not on a flower, but on the berries. These little wasps are so cool to me. They almost look like they're made out of plastic. Whoa, we have, I've documented 15 or 16, maybe 18 species of, of dragonflies. Um, <clears throat> I love this moth, but it has the word boar. So I'm sure the caterpillar must do, or is capable of doing some damage, but looks like they eat on uh, oak galls. Um, when the prickly pear blooms, we have scads of these Kearns flower uh, scarab beetles that show up and they just party inside those blossoms. I have a video and I, it, I'm going like uh, among four blossoms and they're all just full of these uh, beetles. One more slide here and juniper hair streak. Here's a beautiful ground beetle. I love this moth and it was on the Texas kidney wood. <clears throat> Eastern pond hawk in my opening slide. Uh, the one on my hand, yeah, I got it to land on my hand in the backyard, that was fun. And then this beautiful moth was in our driveway. But if you notice, you know, a lot of these insects and critters, they're on plants. They're on, especially, you know, like the kidney wood and the Texas lantana. And, um, you know, if I think about the backyard and with all that uh, Floritam, St. Augustine grass and what a desert it was. And now it's like, look at everything. So out wandering around one evening and looked down, I'm always looking down, and saw this little structure and this bee was going in and out. So I hung around like I always do, took photographs and watched and observed. She was going in and out, but she's the Texas pebble bee. Um, then he showed up, there was a little hanky panky. Then he took off and she went back to work and she doubled that nest. So I'm sure that's where she laid her eggs. She used resin, she can create some kind of glue. Uh, she's uh, uh, able to do that and made this little structure and it was strong. I mean, I didn't try to push down on it or anything, but it was very strong. Um, it's gone now. I, I think it stood, it was there for maybe about a year or so. <clears throat> so another year we have an air conditioning bucket in, in the backyard that collects the water and I use it on the plants and sometimes things fall in and I always check it every morning. But these little beetles uh, were in it and I rescued them, thought they were so beautiful, so cute, and then made a connection. Here's a video. I do have a few videos in my presentation. <clears throat> oh, this is terribly exciting. I mean, it's terribly, terribly exciting. <laughs> I have finally found a dung beetle in our yard. It's the same species. <laughs> it smells too, but that's okay. Okay, and it is a little, little dung beetle. So pretty though, it's metallic blue. I'm so easily entertained. <laughs> First one I've seen in our yard. But it was exciting. So exciting. <laughs> 
cool. Just had to share. And that was some very fresh poop. And so we, I have found other uh, dung beetle species in our yard. I, I threw this slide in, I thought it was kind of fun. Here's a robber fly sitting on top of a dung beetle who's on top of a dung ball. And this was out in the meadow. Um, dung beetles are cool. So another time I was out walking and saw this thing sticking up from the ground. Actually, it was about this much. And I pulled it out and put it in my hand. Of course, I restaged it. I put it back in the ground. I might want to get some pictures of this. And it turned out to be uh, like a larval case, people case, or a robber fly. Not this one, but one like it. And so that's what robber flies um, pupate in, in the ground. So this, this looked really kind of eerie coming up from the ground. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. So robber flies, I love robber flies too. I have, it, have documented at least eight species in our yard. So here's the tiniest one, and it was lurking on top of the, uh, the tip of a dead salvia stem. So that's another good reason why sometimes you don't want to cut down everything, because nature does use it. Um, so here's a close-up of that little robber fly waiting for something to fly by so it can fly out there and grab it and go back and eat it. And that's what robber flies do. I think this one might be eating a honeybee. Uh, very interesting insects. So... So of course I have to have a few slides on spiders because you know they're my thing. And um, like I mentioned, I started reading up and studying them in the late nineties and then later on started giving programs. But the first time, you know, I knew about green link spiders, but I didn't know, and, and they hunt like cats, like jumping spiders do. Um, they're great mothers, but I didn't know that when the little ones um, emerge, the spiderlings, that they're orange. I mean, you've got this beautiful green spider and their spiderlings are orange. And so she stays with the egg sac until they come out and then she dies and, and they, they survive, not all of them through the winter. This past summer, we had a, a nice population of yellow garden spiders in our yard. And, and in the evening, I'd go around and do like roll call, take a head check. Um, There's like six or seven of them and I knew that these are always the females, the large, um, the zigzag spiders, that there's a lot of common names for this particular spider. <clears throat> and I knew that the male was much smaller and I knew, you know, that they show up later on and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, we had a lot of males. So I was able to get some really nice pictures of the male and what happens. And so in the spider world, in order for spiders to grow, they have to shed their hard exoskeleton. And so the last time a female sheds her um, skin, she's ready to mate. And so often the males, somehow she must send out for roams and the males pick up on that and they show up and they wait. And so that's what was going on here. They were waiting for this female to, or he was, uh, for her to, to molt for the last time. So right time, right place, I was outside. This picture tells the whole story. So here it is, she molted, they, they made it, I'm sure, and then she murdered him. There he is down there. And so this doesn't always happen. Males get away and they will even mate with other females, but in his situation, he didn't make it out alive. Here's a little skipper in the back, background, Texas lantana flower. So then another time I was outside and I had this little sack spider in my hand and, you know, taking pictures, I'm sure for iNaturalist, everything was going along well. Well, all of a sudden, and I mean, this is happening in my hand and I've got my phone, you know, on the other hand, this wasp shows up, tacks the spider. You can see she's stinging the spider right here, giving her a paralyzing sting, tussles with the spider. I mean, the spider, you know, loses a leg. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, it's all happening in my hand. Here's a little video that I managed to. It's all my fault. <laughs> so what happened was, is the wasp came in. I don't know how she found the spider in my hand, but stung the spider, paralyzed the spider, then flew off with the spider to her burrow, her nest, uh, her little ones, the larvae, will have fresh spider to feed on whenever they're hatched. And uh, the spider's alive, but she's a paralyzed. So my comedian husband made this little uh, poster, I guess, for his Facebook page. Uh, Dead or alive, wanted a black wasp. He's funny. 
So look again, I had fun putting these slides together. Um, so when is a bee not a bee? Here's, um, so when it's a fly, this little guy, I think I fished out of the air conditioning bucket. I think I'm gonna get some hate mail, but hey, there were two little tree frogs this morning in the air conditioning bucket enjoying it. So it, it was a good thing. Um, anyway, so this little guy is, is not alive. Here's a picture that I borrowed because they evidently fly really fast and they're hard to get pictures of. But yes, so this is actually a bee fly. When is a firefly not a firefly? And I had to reword this because I got to thinking, Cheryl, fireflies are beetles. So when is it, when it's a different kind of beetle? This is a firefly mimicking longhorn beetle. I saw this for the first time on the golden, plateau golden eye, just resting. And uh, I threw in a picture of a real firefly and it, it's uncanny. I mean, they really do look a, a lot alike, but the long antenna was kind of a, uh, clue for me that this is not a firefly. When is a when is an ant not an ant? When it's a spider, I love these guys. An ant mimic jumping spider. So spiders have two body parts. Insects have three, and then spiders have eight legs. Insects have six. So if you look, it looks like this is two body you know parts, but it's actually one. And then this spider will wave its front legs like antenna. And it also kind of walks jerky. So you really have to look closely to see that, hey, that's not an ant, it's actually a spider. It's really fun when I find one of these. So when is a bumblebee? Not a bumblebee, when it's a fly. It's the, this one is the largest robber fly in our yard. They're very fierce looking. Um, they're pretty big. I've seen one feeding on a green uh, June be beetle. So you know how big those are. Um, they're harmless as far as I know. They're, they're harmless. They just look really, really fierce. Um, when is a bumblebee not a bumblebee? I bet you all have seen these. Had a lot of them this year. When it's a moth, a snowberry clear wing. Uh, that Texas lantana really does attract a lot of uh, pollinators. I threw in this... Um, slide, this is the caterpillar for that particular moth. And I saw, this was oh, a couple of years ago, I saw frass on the front sidewalk um, and looked up and found these guys on the yellow honeysuckle, which is a form of the native coral honeysuckle. They're big, big caterpillars, uh, kind of mm -hmm. like your tomato hornworms. But um, so yeah, they're using the, the native honeysuckles. When is a wasp not a wasp? Oh, I love this moth as well. This is a Texas wasp moth and it's nectaring on a white mist flower. And uh, that looks like the fragrant mist flower. And those are just starting to bloom now in our yard. And thank goodness my neighbors, our neighbors know me and get me and understand me because uh, otherwise, you know, if you drive by on 9th Street and you see this woman hanging out in her front yard, just lurking by, uh, you know, these shrubs, you probably think she's pretty odd, but my, my neighbors know what I'm doing. They still love me. So when is an ant not an ant? When it's a wasp, the velvet ant, uh, it's a female solitary wasp. Here is, uh, I had to borrow a picture of a male. Don't see them very often. Um, there's also something called a red velvet ant, and it's not this because um, that's a um, larger, I think, wasp. Anyway, I don't see those in our yard. I've only seen these velvet ants. When is a hornet not a hornet? When it's a fly, take a look at this. It's an Eastern hornet fly. Look at those eyes. Amazing, just amazing. And when is a scary little monster not? One time I've seen this caterpillar, a Tursa sphinx moth. She was on, he or she was on our scarlet vivardia, the trumpetilla, which is native, more native to West Texas. And I got to thinking I should throw in a slide of the adult. Um, didn't see the adult. We must have had one come by and drop an egg and uh, maybe at night or something, but what a beautiful moth. I wish I could see one in person. Um, say what? So here's a little video. So I just happened to see this, like the fountain's running and there's this little, what is that? I've got it on iNaturalist, so I'll let you know, but maybe you recognize it. 
It's just hanging on. I don't know. Pretty cool looking. So what do you think this is? A beetle? This is new to me. <laughs> Maybe it is a bee. Uh, nope, it wasn't a bee. It was a tumbling flower beetle. And uh, that, that was a new one to me. And I've never seen one do that behavior since. And we also, I've also seen a tumbling Warner flower beetle on our antelope horns out in the meadow. And then this other doesn't even have a common name. It's a pretty tiny little um, um, flower beetle, tumbling flower beetle. It was on the pincushion daisy or a fragrant gallardia, really tiny little beetles. And here's another fountain story. So I noticed this red wasp taking a shower, taking a bath on the fountain. I like the tumbling flower beetle last year that I got a bath. And the bees love it here as well. The wasp has been here 20 minutes or so. Just enjoy, oops, enjoy the water. It's not even that hot yet. So just a real quick follow-up video on that. So I turned off the fountain because we have to turn it off at night. The wasp was still there. I think she was really enjoying her time. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I thought it was. <laughs> This could go on for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, it was like we have, um, come on, we have a lot of those red wasps flying around all the time. And that's the only time I've seen one do that. And, it, you know, you think about it, each organism is different. They're not all just the same. And even flowers, you know, like stiff green thread, I did pictures of them one year, and each blossom was different. So everything, just like us, were each unique and different. So here's a blue wasp that was digging in a corner um, patio with sand. And so I watched that for a while. Beautiful wasp. <laughs> well <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm not going to leave you hanging. I did uh, stick around to find out what she was going after. It's a bowl sand roach. You can see it here a little bit, and here is another picture of it. So this particular kind of uh, wasp, they do um, hunt these roaches, and so she'll either drag them back or carry them back, probably drag them to her burrow, her nest, and she'll lay one egg on the roach. And I'm sure she stung them, kind of like the, the spider wasp. And the um, larva will have fresh roach to feed on. Out in the meadow this past summer, I, uh, I love different kinds of flies. So 
shot a really quick little video of this guy because it's so interesting. It's a signal fly. Might have been signaling for a mate. <laughs> There's not a lot of information on, on these spot on these oh, flies. Beautiful fly. And you think of fly, you think of house flies, right? Oh my goodness, there's so many different kinds of flies. So aha moments, a neighbor, Wes, messaged me this past summer and said, what's this white stuff on my plants? And I'm like, I kind of blew them off. I said, oh, mealy bugs, you know? And then I got to thinking, well, wait a minute, I know where some is. And I went out to check, went out to check on the, on the Texas nightshade. And as an aside on that, Ricky Lennox gave me that. I've known Ricky since 2012. He gave one of our programs my, uh, when I trained to be a nat master naturalist and then saw him off and on through the years at Texas Master Naturalist Conference. And, and uh, he brought some of this for one of his sessions and I asked if I could take some home. And he, he said, sure. And then he warned me and yes, Ricky, it does spread. It's very uh, aggressive. But anyway, I went out to check because I knew we had some and took some pictures. This is the larva um, and then the little filaments. So it's a plant hopper, plant hoppers. They do hop, um, that's the adult. So I let Wes know, of course, um, what that was feeding on our plants. And you know, it, it, it didn't do any damage. I let him go, I didn't bother him. So what the heck was that bug doing on our Western ironweed? James and I were out one evening. So we have Western and woolly uh, ironweed in the backyard. And I made the mistake of putting them too close together because they did the wild thing. And now I've got hybrid ironweed. Um, but anyway, kept watching them, took this little video. I don't know if y'all have seen this before. That's why they're called sharpshooters. They're actually shooting liquid from their from the end, from their abdomens. You see, sucking on the plant and then extra um, water, he just shoots out. That's what goes on. So just a couple of quick stories. Um, one summer we had three orphan um, Eastern fox squirrels. Their mother we think was run over in the street. They fell out, two of them fell out and one stayed up in the live oak. And overnight I was so worried about him and kept checking on him. If, um, in the front yard, I'd go outside and, and the next morning and just started talking to him. He must have been 15 feet up in that big live oak, kept talking and talking and I talked him down, I'll never forget it. He came down head first and I had a little towel ready for him and we took him out to uh, join his sisters at the Candelia Wildlife Rescue Center. Um, so there's a little story that was in Texas Co-op Power about that. So then there was Lazarus. Okay, another uh, air conditioning bucket story. Found this at the bot, the very bottom, fished it out. You know, it's an ironclad beetle. And lo and behold, if that guy didn't come back to life and did some research. And I wrote a little story also on um, ironclad beetles, not just Lazarus, because this happened several times. It's on my blog. Um, to me, it was just amazing. You know, I thought this beetle was dead and felt so bad about it. But then they came back to life. So they have this ability, not forever, I mean, but after a few hours, they do have, they can store oxygen somehow in their, ex, their exoskeleton, I guess. Um, and they're called ironclads because their exoskeleton is so darn hard. That's pretty interesting. You might want to read that. So a mystery. This summer, I saw these leaves growing out of a coral uh, honeysuckle. It, yeah, the coral. That's right. Um, it was a volunteer coral honeysuckle. And I said, okay, you can grow there. And so these leaves didn't match up. And then I saw this bloom. It's like, that looks really familiar. Well, it was a morning glory, the Lindheimer's morning glory, which we did. I went back to my blog and did a search because I knew we'd planted it, but we planted it back in April of 2013 and it died and I was sad. Um, but then somehow, I don't know if the rains, if there happened to be a one seed that went into the ground and the rains was, um, you know, it germinated, but I have collected at least one, maybe two seed pods and I've got two more working out there. So I'm hoping to get some seeds and, and hopefully we can keep this going in the yard. I love it. Um, back to that Texas nightshade. Anytime something's eating one of our plants, I, I just want to know what it is. You know, what, 
what's going on? And so um, finally I found these tiny little grubs, um, got some pictures and put two and two together. And that's the larval, the larva of the opu opulent Lima leaf beetle. And their most common host is Texas nightshade. So that was cool. I'm almost done. Got this little video here. It's kind of, it was just fun. We have birds too. And Gabe's in heaven now, his cat. Oh my goodness. Chip <laughs> mouse wanted fresh fur. Where'd it go? Behind her. There she is. Wow, such a brave bird. <laughs> we have fun in our yard. So my grand finale, sort of. So I dumped water out of this bird bath and then noticed something on the side. Oh, shoot, forget it. Whoa, uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh-oh, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, did they leave? No, no, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do if I had a wasp stuck in my hair and that camera just flipped on its own, so it was just a weird mistake of a video but anyway viva native plants um i'm i love native plants in our native gardens and i i hope you got a little something out of this kind of crazy presentation thank you so thank you cheryl sharing. that was that was wonderful so many interesting little creatures are you taking most of those photos with an iphone you said Yes, yes, I've gotten very lazy. I used to go out with my 35 uh, millimeter camera and it's too much trouble. <laughs> well, you got some really nice close ups and some very, very interesting photos for that. Um, we had a question about, um, let me see if I can find it. Do the mimic spiders prey on the ants? The spiders that look like ants, do they eat ants? They might, you know, that's a good question. I, I couldn't answer that with authority, um, but jumping spiders, you know, they hunt like cats. And so I'm sure they're hunting anything that's, you know, a little smaller than they are, like uh, maybe gnats or uh, little caterpillars or something like that. But um, I have not observed one of those eat an ant, but they might. <laughs> hmm. Okay, and I had a question about you showed a a moth and that was making a a tunnel on a stem. Do you remember that making kind of a little wrapping the stem in kind of a little um, sand tunnel? A sand tunnel, a moth or a caterpillar? No, or I think it. I think it was a moth or a fly making a tunnel. Oh, it doesn't. I can't think of what that would be. Well. I should have written it down. I was busy listening to everything else. I forgot to write mm. down the name of it. So never mind. Sorry. Um, we have a request to, to put your contact slide information back up. Can you do that? Sure. Okay. That's good. I follow several gardening blogs, you know, central Texas type gardening blogs. And um, this, this is just one of my favorites. Most of the other ones don't do so many insects and things like that. And uh, 
I see a lot of these same things in my gardens, but Mm -hmm. don't take the time to photograph them or look them up. So it's really lovely when I see your blog and it answers questions that I haven't, you know, didn't bother to research myself because I was too lazy. So it make you make a great research assistant. I appreciate that. Probably people think I have too much time on my hands. <laughs> but it's just fun. I just enjoy it. Um, well, and that your your enjoyment in it really shows in your writing and your videos and everything. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl, for this wonderful presentation. Yeah. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.